Hello and welcome to the Friday, July 17th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And yes, top of the news, of course, is a major compromise of a number of high-profile Twitter accounts late yesterday. Now, at this point, we don't know a lot about the nature of this compromise, but apparently it involved an insider. What isn't quite clear is if this insider willingly contributed or if it was more some type of social engineering or spear phishing attack that led to an insider relinquishing credentials in order to help the perpetrators of this attack. Not much really to take away from this other than yes, insider attacks are difficult to defend against and you probably shouldn't believe everything that you see written on Twitter. Yes, we do have a smaller update for the SIGRED vulnerability, Microsoft DNS Server Vulnerability CVE 2020-1350. And the update here is that there is now a proof of concept exploit out there that does trigger a denial of service attack. So it crashes the vulnerable Microsoft DNS server. In that respect, this is probably sort of a best case as far as proof of concept exploits go for this vulnerability. It allows you to experiment with the vulnerability, test your defenses, test your detection capabilities for uh, this particular attack, and it doesn't reveal anything that was not already widely known. Of course, a full remote code execution exploit is still widely expected, and uh, well, I wouldn't put my hopes up for a quiet Friday afternoon. And of course, this week wouldn't be complete with a few more patches. Apple updated pretty much everything. So we got updates for macOS, watchOS, tvOS, iOS, and then also for Safari, which of course applies to the older versions of macOS. Now, what's sort of interesting is that we also got updates for older still supported versions of iOS and watchOS, but these updates actually had no security content. As far as the security content goes for the other operating system, nothing sort of outstanding, shocking here. Yes, as usual for Apple, there are some older vulnerabilities in open source software being addressed, a lot of approach escalation vulnerabilities, and then of course, a few vulnerabilities that could lead to remote code execution if a user, for example, watches a video, listens to audio, or an image, pretty much the standard sort of set of vulnerabilities that we also get from other operating systems. A bug that I sort of found a little bit curious and maybe its impact is more annoying than anything else is that in messages, it was possible for a user to rejoin a group after they were removed from that particular iMessage group. Well, another critical vulnerability that was patched earlier uh, this week, actually on July 13th, was a vulnerability in SAP NetWeaver AS Java. This vulnerability, CVE 2020-6287, could potentially be used to exfiltrate data from uh, affected installations. And yes, we do have a proof of concept for this vulnerability now as well. According to the uh, GitHub description of the vulnerability, and I had no chance to test it myself, well, uh, this proof of concept does not actually launch the remote code execution uh, or the user creation functionality that uh, this vulnerability allows for, but it will just show if a particular server is vulnerable or not. So, Definitely pay attention to your SAP servers and uh, while this, and it looks like uh, this exploit is already being used in the wild to scan affected systems. Well, it's Friday again, so I have with me a SANS EDU graduate student who worked on a research paper. Aaron, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, uh, my name is Aaron Elliard. I'm a cybersecurity systems engineer at the Pennsylvania State University and a candidate for the MSISE program from the SANS Technology Institute. 
So great. Can you tell us a little bit about your research? I think it involved Office 365, or? Yes. Uh, so my research paper focused on improving the efficiency of SOC analysts who are investigating Office 365 business email compromise scenarios. Specifically, it explored performing an investigation uh, using Microsoft's built-in tools uh, versus using a custom-developed GUI solution with PowerShell as its backend. So you actually set up a GUI solution that sort of wraps around all of these PowerShell scripts that you wrote? Uh, so I actually wrote them uh, just for the paper. Now, a business email compromise is, of course, you no know, one of the hot topics uh, these days. And in particular, cloud mail service providers like uh, Outlook 365 are a huge target because all it takes is sort of the credentials to the user. And you have these standard uh, login interfaces that are, of course, easy to fish. In your experience, uh, these business email compromise involving Outlook 365, what do you see the attacker usually do once they fish an account? Uh, norm normally, so in my experience, I've observed two uh, different scenarios. Uh, one is, of course, your, your normal uh, espionage scenario where they will just sit with access to the account and uh, simply view emails that come into it and hoping to get some of the some information that is uh, you know, perhaps some intellectual property from the organization. Uh, and the other use case seems to be that they will use the account to... Um, Further send out other spam or or uh, use it to perhaps do a man in the middle with another uh, business unit uh, of the organization, and that goal, of course, would be to further gain uh, more credentials and or uh, maybe a little bit more important credentials from someone uh, in a different role in the organization. So, what usually causes that you learn about a business email compromise in your organization? Is it a user reporting it, or uh, is it uh, spam being sent on the user's account? Uh, what usually triggers the investigation? Uh, there can be a variety of different things that trigger the investigation. Um, normally, our, we see a lot of investigations that are triggered by a geographically improbable IP address uh, logins. So, so logins that are coming from a area where the user would not be. Uh, and, and those trigger an investigation simply because of the, uh, the, the fact that it's impossible to travel between the, the distance um, that, they, that the uh, real user logged in and the, and the attacker logged in. Um, that, that's one, re one way we uh, normally see these. And then uh, another way simply could be the user themselves, or it's reported from, uh, from other users within our organization that say they've received an odd email from, from an individual, right? And uh, and once you see that that happening, you have a pretty uh, good idea of that it could be a business email compromise scenario. Your script and the GUI that you build around uh, it actually helps with the investigation of uh, these uh, business email compromise uh, incidents. Can you walk us through sort of some of the things that these scripts uh, automate for you? Yeah, sure. So. Um, the the tool is named Kit. Um, it, it's simply a, a reference to Knight Rider, uh, no fancy acronym, and it was built using PowerShell Studio. Um, and the idea really was to be uh, an open source uh, platform uh, for business Office three sixty five business email compromise. Uh, so by default, when you first run the tool, uh, it will go ahead and pull uh, user information um, for that for the user that you selected and once it has that information pooled, so that, that can be um, stuff as simple as the, the user's address, their phone number, uh, that kind of information there. Uh, it will compute their last password date based on the password policy for your domain. Uh, and then it will also go ahead and pull the inbox rules for the user and uh, their Azure AD sign-in logs for the last month. Uh, so that's that's kind of a, a generic breakdown of what, of what you have uh, whenever the first tool first loads. And then you have other options after that um, if you wish to investigate further. Now, uh, one business email compromise that I sort of was a little bit involved in uh, many years ago, one thing the attacker did was to add a forward rule uh, to the user's account. So that way the attacker got copies of all email that this user received. One of the problems there was how much PII was potentially lost. And it was actually difficult for the company at the time uh, to gain access uh, to good logs from Outlook 365. Does your tool help with some of that? Or is this some behavior that uh, you observed as well? That is definitely a behavior I've observed. Um, 
So the tool does allow you to view the forwarding settings that are set for a user-specific account, as well as the the inbox rules that are set for that account, right? So, so there's two specific scenarios where that you could have there. Um, one would be the the attacker sets the forwarding rule um, of the account to forward email out to an external uh, address that they control, and the other is that they simply set up a, an inbox rule to forward any specific email, um, you know, with certain keywords that they're looking for. And so, as far as the the first scenario goes. Uh, there isn't great logging um, to state what the the attacker was sent, other than looking at message trace logs uh, for your organization to see um, what email was sent out to this uh, to this uh, external email address that's controlled by the attacker. Uh, for that second scenario, where they where they have an inbox rule that forwards uh, certain emails, um, with, you know, with generic keywords that they could be looking for. Uh, that's really going to, you're just going to have to do a, some form of investigation on on the inbox and look for emails that might have contained that um, contain those keywords within the time frame that the attacker had access to the email uh, to the email inbox. Now I know it's a bit beyond the scope of what your tool does. And you're really more investigating it, uh, but in investigating all of these business email compromises. Any lessons you sort of learned in how to prevent uh, these compromises or what makes a user susceptible uh, to these compromises? Well, first and foremost, uh, and I'm sure every user uh, or every person listening to this has heard this before, but uh, it's two-factor authentication all the way. Uh, that prevents a lot of these types of uh, compromises when when the attacker is logging in from um, someplace they shouldn't be. Uh, two factor stops them mostly uh, dead in their tracks. Uh, the other, the other thing um, that we've observed that can really help with these types of scenarios is disabling legacy protocols that don't allow uh, for two factor to be used. So these legacy protocols often uh, allow the attacker to uh, simply log in and test uh, credentials, even if two factor is enabled for your organization. So uh, it, it really almost does you no good if you have two factor deployed, but then also leave the legacy protocols up because the attacker can still uh, can still attempt to authenticate. Yeah, so with these legacy protocols in uh, Outlook 365, uh, the user, if you, if you legitimately use it, of course, with that, the attacker would just use the username and password, or it's not that you get uh, application-specific password, how it's sometimes called, which is a random string that you're being assigned. Or... Correct, correct. So, th- so these... these uh, Legacy protocols often uh, we we see the attacker attempt to authenticate over over something like IMAP uh, or SMTP, and those are uh, fairly like fairly um, older protocols that don't support the the uh, two factor authentication. So once we um, see those kind of p- patterns, we uh, almost certainly uh, know that there could be a, a business email compromise involved, especially if it's from a location where where a user is not. Uh, is not normally located. What are you up to next? You still, I think, have a little bit of work to do in your uh, graduate program here. Yes, so I'm about halfway through. Uh, up next, I, I start uh, the Forensics 508 class, and I'm incredibly excited for that. I really appreciate that you took the time here today uh, to join me and to talk about uh, KIT, this research project of yours, a link to the GitHub repository for KIT as well as a link to the research paper will be available in the show notes, of course. And this is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.